Affinity Designer is a fast and powerful vector program that is great for professional graphic designers. It requires no subscription and runs on all major platforms, including Windows, Mac, and iPad. In this crash course, I'll give you an overview of how to use this powerful tool, and I don't assume any prior knowledge of vector design software. We'll look at creating shapes, working with the different tools, typography, using images, and more. In this video, I'll be using the Windows version of Affinity Designer, but all these concepts should be applicable to the Mac OS version as well. The version I'm currently using is 2.3, but any version 2 of the software should work. There's also an iPad version that doesn't have all the features of the desktop versions, but it's still very functional. Most of the concepts I cover in this video should be applicable to the iPad version as well, although the interface will definitely look a lot different. I've organized this video into chapters so you can easily see how it's arranged. A class like this is always a trade-off between depth and variety of topics. If you'd like to learn more about any of these tools or features in Affinity Designer, chances are I have a video on it in my Affinity Designer playlist on my channel. So be sure to check that out later. Also, I have a free ebook with Affinity Designer tips that you can download right now. It has some cool tricks and also some warnings about this program that you won't want to miss. The ebook is completely free, but if you want to donate a few extra dollars to help support this channel, it would be much appreciated. You can find the link in the description below. Now I know you're dying to jump into Affinity Designer, but I first want to give you a little bit of context of where it sits in the wider world of graphics programs. As I said earlier, Affinity Designer is a vector graphics program. Vector programs are often used for things like logos, user interface design, icons, typography, and many other use cases. Now kind of the other programs in this space that compete with Affinity Designer are things you may have heard of such as Adobe Illustrator, CorelDRAW, and Inkscape. Affinity Designer itself also sits within the suite of other Affinity programs. And these are Affinity Photo and Affinity Publisher. Affinity Photo is their raster-based tool, which is kind of a competitor to Photoshop. And Affinity Publisher is a desktop publishing tool for creating things like PDFs. And you can think of it as kind of a competitor to InDesign. Now, among these Affinity programs, such as Photo, Designer, and Publisher, you may be wondering when to use which. And the short answer is really, as you start to create more designs, you kind of get a feel of what projects are more appropriate for Affinity Designer versus Affinity Photo. But one of the great things about Designer is that it does actually have some raster-based operations in it too. In fact, it has a whole workspace that's designed for pixel operations. So in Affinity Designer, you can actually work with bitmap formats, and we'll explore how to do that in this video. Now, in terms of buying Affinity Designer, currently you can buy it individually, or you can buy it as part of the whole Affinity suite of programs. There's also a universal license that gives you access to all the programs on all platforms, which is really cool for people to have a desktop machine and also an iPad device. But by far one of the coolest things about how to buy it is that it just requires a one-time purchase fee. There's no subscription to the Affinity products. And when you buy a particular version of the software, you get free updates for that version until the new version comes out. So if you buy version 2.0, you get all the version 2 updates for free. If there's ever a version 3, I don't know how much it will cost, but in the past, existing users have also gotten a discount when upgrading to a new major version. There's also a free trial, so you don't really have anything to lose by downloading it and giving it a shot. Now, who is this program for? Well, of course, it's for anyone who wants to use it, but it's really well suited for individual designers who don't have to work with the Adobe ecosystem. If you're a lone designer and you have full control over the file formats you work with, Affinity Designer is probably a good match for you. But if you're on a team and you're working with people that are constantly swapping Photoshop files or Adobe Illustrator files, it might be harder to use Affinity Designer. The Affinity programs can usually read the Adobe file formats, but results can definitely vary and saving to those formats is certainly hit or miss. So with all that out of the way, let's finally open this program, look at how to create a document and start working with some basic shapes. In this section, we'll look at how to work with basic shapes, how to create them, how to align them, and how to put them in groups for easy management. But before we do that, let's look at creating a document to begin with. So as you may expect, you do this with File, New. And this menu here will give you lots of options, but let's just create a simple document based on pixels. And I'll just make it 4,000 by 3,000. And then I'll click Create. So the first thing you should do when you make a new document is to save it. So I'll do File, Save. Now what you notice here is that the file type is AF Design, and that's a specific Affinity Designer file type. You may have a need to create SVGs or PNGs. That can be done with the export function, which we'll look at later. But for now, let's just save our file in a basic way like this. I'll just call it my file and save. Now I want to start this lesson by showing you how to do something useful, such as create shapes. But one thing I do want to show you up front is what to do if you accidentally mess up your UI and get it all in a jumbled state. For example, let's say maybe I have that there. I have something like this over here. You know, you get something that doesn't look good. So what you can do is you can reset your interface by going to Window, Studio, Reset Studio. So now that I did that, this is basically the default setting for Affinity Designer. That should solve most problems you have. There are a couple other options here. If you go to View, 
If you're not seeing something correctly, perhaps you need to have it say show tools or show toolbar. Check these settings if things aren't looking exactly correct. But between these settings here and doing the window studio reset studio, that should get you in the basic default state. Okay, so let's look at how to actually create shapes now. And those are done with this toolbar over here on the left. And you'll see three different icons here. I'll start from the bottom up. We have the ellipse tool, which is also how you create a circle. We have the rectangle tool, which can be used for squares. And then we have this other one. For me, it says a star, but for you, it might be different. The important thing is if you click on this arrow, you'll see all the different options here. And it will show the last one you used. In the default state, I think it might be rounded rectangle, but you can select the other ones here. So let me start by creating a circle. So I'll select the ellipse tool. And what I can do is I can click and drag. And if I let go, I have an ellipse here. I'll click off of it. You can see it's an ellipse. Now I'll do that again. If I want it to be a perfect circle, I can hold the shift key. So I'll hold shift, I'll click and drag. And now I have a perfect circle. A similar thing can be done with the rectangle tool. So if I click on the rectangle, I can draw any size rectangle I want. Or if I hold shift, I can draw a square. It'll limit it to those dimensions. And with my special shapes over here, I have the star currently selected. I'll select something else. If I click and hold, let's select the triangle. So once again, I can click and drag. I can make it any dimensions I want. And I can also drag and hold shift to limit it to certain dimensions. Now when I create these shapes, I can also change their color. And no doubt you've probably already noticed this color wheel over here. So when my shape is selected, I'll click some other color. I can rotate around to change the hue. Or within a diamond, I can change the saturation and brightness. So I'll draw a square here. Maybe I want that square to be blue. I'll go back and do my triangle. Let's do a green triangle, really bright green. Now let's say I want to move my shapes around. So what you would do in this situation is you would click on this black arrow up here called the move tool. Also, you can use the keyboard shortcut V. And when this is selected, you can click on your shape and then you can click and drag it around your workspace here. So I can move these shapes around. What you'll also notice is when I click on a shape, I have these controls here. So when I click on these dots on the side, I can resize it or reshape it. And like before, if I hold shift, it will keep the initial dimensions of that object. Now this control up here on the top, this is the rotate control. So if I click this, I can rotate it in different directions. And this works with all my shapes. So I have the triangle here. I can rotate that around. I can resize it. I have a circle here. If I want it to be an ellipse, I can resize it to an ellipse. Now one thing you can also do is easily copy your objects. So with my object selected, I can hold the control key. And if I click and drag, I've made a copy of it. So I'll copy the square. I'll hit control, click, drag. If you hold shift, it will limit it to certain directions here. So it keeps it aligned in this direction. So I'm holding shift again, so it's keeping my shapes well aligned. Now you may also notice there's this white arrow here called the node tool. We'll use that one a little bit more later. Let me create some more shapes on my document here. Do a pie chart, just make it yellow. And let's do a star and we'll make it red. Now what you notice about these shapes is when I click on them, I get different options up here on the toolbar. So let me click on the star because that one gives you some good idea of what the differences are. So you can see with the star, I have this option here for points. So I can change the number of points there are. But if I click on the square here, I don't get that option. So this is going to give me special options based on the type of shape. So with this pie chart one here, you can see I can change the angle. I can change the end angle. I can change the radius in the middle. So these shapes basically have smart options and when you click on them, you can customize them up here and they'll be different for each shape. I won't go into each shape in detail, but you can experiment with trying different ones and seeing which options you get. Now that you've seen some shapes in action, let me just describe how I'm moving around the canvas. With the scroll wheel, I can move the canvas up and down. If I want to zoom in and out, I can hold control and then I can use the scroll wheel. So I'm holding control and I can zoom in and out with my scroll wheel and it'll follow my mouse cursor here. And if I hold the middle mouse button, I can drag my canvas around. There's a couple of ways to do this. You can also hold space bar and click with the left mouse button to move your canvas around. So this is very useful for navigating. So once again, the scroll wheel goes up and down. Holding control is how you zoom in there. And holding space bar while you click and drag will let you move the canvas around. Now you can also rotate the canvas. So if I hold alt and use the scroll wheel, that will rotate the canvas. But I usually don't do that too much, so I'll put it back to zero here. 
Okay, let's get back to working with our shapes. So this is one of the smart shapes. It's a quotation box. And you can see it has lots of options up here. But the options I really want to show you are these up here, the rotation and mirroring options. And I chose this shape because it's not symmetric, so you can easily see when it's being flipped and rotated. So this first option up here is flip horizontal. So if I click this, my shape would be flipping back and forth. So I can click it there. Next, we have flip vertical. So if I click this, my shape will flip up and down. And then I can rotate my object 90 degrees. So I can click this to rotate it counterclockwise. Or I can rotate it clockwise. So these options up here are really useful when you want to flip and rotate the current object. So let's look at the option next to that alignment. And it's gray because I have nothing selected. I'm going to select multiple rectangles here by clicking and dragging over them. And now you can see my alignment option is enabled. So if I click this, what this is going to do is it's going to allow me to line up my objects in a certain way. So let's look at the align vertically here. So if I click this button up here, align top, it aligns all my boxes to the topmost box. I'll cancel that. Let's do it again. I can align them in the middle so they're all aligned in the middle. I can align them in the bottom here. So that means they're all aligned down at the bottom. Let me rearrange these a bit just to make it easier to see how to space them evenly. So let's say I wanted to get these all evenly on one line. So what I could do is I can move these all in different areas. With them all selected, what I could do is I could select the alignment options here. I could align them all in the middle. And now over here, these horizontal options, I could space them evenly. So I could space them horizontally. Let's do an example of stacking these all in a straight line up and down. So I could arrange them somehow. I could select them. And I could say align center. And I could space them evenly this way. So I'd click space vertically. And you can see they're aligned in a nice column. So these alignment options are very useful when you want to get things lined up in a certain way. Snapping is another way we can get objects to line up in specific places. So by default, it's not on. So if I click on this circle and drag it around, nothing special really happens. But if I click on this magnet up here that says snapping, let me drag my circle around now. And you can see these green and red lines start to appear. And Affinity Designer will snap my object to logical places. So often it'll pick the midpoint of another object. So if I drag near my triangle here, it's aligning to this green line, which is the middle point of it. I can click this square over here and drag it next to my other one. And you can see how it's starting to snap. I can drag it next to the circle. And you can see it's automatically trying to center them. Now there are advanced snapping controls. If you click this down arrow here, you can customize it, but I find the default options are pretty good to begin with, so I don't do too much with this. Really, all you need to know is how to turn it on and off. Now, if you have snapping turned on and you want to move an object, if you want to temporarily disable it, you can hold the Alt button. So even though I have snapping on, if I hold Alt, it'll temporarily turn it off so I can just move my object wherever I want. And if I let go of Alt and I move it around, snapping is enabled again. Now, one word of warning I should give you about snapping, even if you snap two objects together, you can still see a hairline fracture between them sometimes. So let me take these two squares. I'll snap one to the other and they're snapped together. But if I click off and I zoom in, you can see there's a little bit of a thin line there. So that's definitely something to be aware of when you're building patterns or something where you want there to be a solid area of color. Just watch out for that. Now, sometimes you want to create your own special places in the document to align an object to. In that case, we can use rulers and guides. So to show a ruler, you can go to View, Show Rulers. And you'll see these numbers at the top and the left side. That's your ruler. The numbers represent the units that your document was created in. So here it says 15, and there's 15 on the bottom left. If you forget what your document size is, you can click Document Setup here. And here I can see it's 15 inches by 15 inches. And that matches what I'm seeing over here with the 15. Now, if you want, you can also click the top left corner here and reorient your ruler. But I rarely do that, so I'm just going to hit Control z and leave it at the default location. So my top left is 0, 0 here. Now, the cool feature of rulers is that they allow us to create guides. So a guide is a line in your document that you can align against. So I have my top ruler here. To create a guide, I'll just click on it and drag down. So now I have this special line in my document. And if I grab an object, it snaps to that line. If I wanted to create a guide going up and down, I would click on my left ruler here and drag sideways. And now I can click an object and I can snap it to that. So this can be really useful if you're creating margins or some other specifically formatted document. If you want to remove a guide, you can just click it and drag it off the screen. You can also toggle the guides on and off. So up here I have view. I can say show guides. I'll unclick that so it's gone. And I can show it again with view show guides. 
Also, if you have a lot of guides and it's getting complicated to not click on them, you can lock them in place. You can do that with view lock guides. So with lock guides selected, I can't select my guide anymore. It still works, but it's not gonna get in the way of my mouse cursor. I won't accidentally click on it and move it. I'll unlock it though and get rid of it. Now you can also create guides with the menu option. So you can go to view guides and I have no guides here yet, but I can create one. So let's create a horizontal guide. And you can see by default it said 50%. So it's here at that seven and a half inch mark. Let's create a vertical guide at 25%. So I'll add this here. And I can change this to 25. So you can see that's the 25% point in my document. And if you created guides from the manual option over here, they'll also show up here. There's other things here for coloring and all that kind of stuff, but I think we covered enough for now. One last alignment option I'll mention is grids. So you can go to view, show grid. And this is also a way to snap objects to certain locations. So I can resize my square to fit exact positions here. If you want to customize how this grid looks, you can go to view, grid and axis. And then there are also many advanced options here, but I'll just say the basics here, you can change the color. I can change the divisions here. So I subdivide it with five divisions here. So you can see my main line is red and the subdivisions are blue. There's lots of advanced options here if you wanna create perspective grids and things like that. But for basic settings, this is how you would do it. So what happens if I drag shapes on top of each other? Well, let me take this green square here and I'll drag it over the triangle and you can see it's appearing behind it. And if I take the circle and I drag it over, it's appearing behind the green square. So the way things overlap will be based on their position in the layer stack. You'll use layers a lot in Affinity Designer and we'll go over some of the basics in this section. So over here, you can see probably one of the most important tabs, which is the layers tab. And the top to bottom order matters a lot. So you can see on the top, we have the triangle. And indeed, that's the one that appears in the front. So the higher an object is in the layer stack, the more in front it will appear. So behind the triangle, we have the rectangle here. And underneath the rectangle is the ellipse. And if you're curious at the bottom layer, we have some text here, which we'll talk about later. Now, if I want to rearrange objects, I can click and drag them in the layer stack here. So let's say I want to put the ellipse on top. I can click it and I can drag it all the way on top. Now, be sure not to accidentally click and drag it onto something else. This is a valid operation, but we'll talk about that later. If you do accidentally do that, just hit Control Z to undo it. So once again, you can see how all these things work. If I want my rectangle to be in the front, I'll click and drag it up top. And you can also drag things the other way to put them behind objects. Now there's a couple key options in this layer stack here. One is the visibility, and that's this little dot here on the right. So it's filled in gray, so that means it's visible, but I can make it invisible by clicking on it. So for the triangle, I'll click on this, and now you can see it's invisible. It's still there, but you just can't see it. So I'll toggle it back on. I can select multiple objects at the same time by holding control, and I can also toggle their visibility. So I'll hide the rectangle and the ellipse. So now only the triangle is visible. Let me put them back on. What you can also do is lock an object and that is this icon up here, lock, unlock. So if I lock the triangle, if I click on it, I can't move it. You saw I, I moved the circle. I can move the circle and I can move the square, but I can't move the triangle. Now something to be careful of in Affinity Designer is that when you lock an object, you can still do lots of other operations on it. For example, if I had the triangle selected, I could still change the color of it. This is unlike some other programs that don't let you do anything on an object when it's locked. So just be aware that even if you lock an object in Affinity Designer, you might still be able to do some things on it and that might not be what you want. So I'll unlock the triangle here. We can also change the opacity and this is how transparent an object is. So if I have my rectangle here, let's move it really over these two other shapes. When it's selected, I can click this opacity slider here and I can drag it down. And when I drag it down, you can see that I can see through my square a little bit here. If I make it all the way to zero, it's completely invisible. And if you want to change it back, just click on it and drag it back up. But the opacity setting is based on the current layer you have selected. So if I select the ellipse, I can make that one 50%. And you can see I'm seeing some of the whiteness behind it here. If I go to my rectangle, I can make that 75%. I can reset all of them back to 100 by selecting all of them and just clicking back up to 100 again. Now we saw that you could click and drag objects here in the stack. You can also use these controls up here, which aren't selected at the moment. If I select an object, let me select this rectangle here. Now I have the options up here to move the object around. So these first two options are about moving it backwards. So the first option is to move it to the very back. In other words, the bottom of our layer stack. So I'll click on that. And you can see it went straight to the bottom. Let me undo that. I can move it back by just one layer. So if I click this button here, you can see it just went behind the triangle. 
If I click it again, it'll go just behind the ellipse. And with it selected, I can also start bringing it to the front. So I can move it forward one here. I can move it forward again. If I have it all the way in the back, I can move it all the way to the front with one jump here. So as you work on bigger documents, your layer stacks can get really long and complicated. And in those situations, these options up here are really quick and useful. Now let's look at how we could actually group objects together. So let's say I want to build a simple little shape here. Maybe I build a house. So here's my simple little house and you can see my objects over here on the left. So what I can do is I can select the whole thing. And as we said before, I can hold control and drag to make a copy of something. You can do that when you have multiple objects selected too. So if I hold control and drag, I now have a separate house. But you can see my layer stack is kind of a mess over here. What we can do is you can make a group. So let me delete the second house. Now what I can do is I can select the first house and I can press control G. And now you see I've made a group. And if I expand that group, you see I have all the components of my house here. I can also rename the group so it's something more meaningful. So if I click on this, I can say house. And by the way, you can rename basically anything in your layer stack here. So these rectangles, I could call these windows. I could call the triangle roof. You get the idea. You can name things to make it more useful. But now when I'm working with my document, I don't need to select the whole thing anymore. I can just click it and drag it around. And I can still make copies. I can hold control and I can drag and make a copy. You can see my layer stack is much more organized. I have the two houses separately. When you have a group selected, you can also resize it. So by default, it keeps perspective. If I hold shift, I could actually distort my house if I wanted to. If I let go of shift, it goes back to the normal perspective. Now, when you click on the object, you'll see that by default, you can't really edit what's in it. But actually, that's pretty easy to change. If you just double click, now I can actually start working with the elements inside of it. And if I hit escape, I'm back at my top layer again. So if you have something that's a big group here, you can just double click on it and you can start editing the individual components. So this is my great artwork here. And when something is really expanded over here in your layer stack, just click the arrow to collapse it. So Affinity Designer also has this concept of a layer. So I can click this button here and add a layer. I won't use these layers too much in this tutorial, but basically this is another way you can group your objects together. So I could take this house, I could put it in there. And it's another way of organizing the objects in your document. Sometimes you'll open up someone else's document and you'll see they'll have layers like that. But for the rest of this video, I won't be using those layers too much. I'll just be using groups. Before we go too much further, I do want to give you an idea of how to do basic exporting. So the way you can do that is file export. And what you see here is a preview of your document. And this is where you can choose the different file types you want to export to. So you can do PNG, JPEG. There's a whole bunch of other ones, also SVG. You can also choose the dimensions, but I'll do PNG for now. So I'll do export and I'll just export it here, shapes. And in my file explorer, I can see the file here. Now this is different than saving your document, so make sure you still do that. Later in the video, we'll look at more complex scenarios for exporting your files. In this part, we'll look at how you can add colors to your designs along with strokes and gradients. So let me start by creating a shape and I'll choose a star here. I'll draw my star. And you can see my star is yellow and that is because I had the yellow color selected over here. So now with my shape selected here, I can change the color. Now there's a lot of options over here. I'll go over some of them. One of the more interesting ones is what happens when you click these three lines over here. If you like, you can choose different visualizations for the color menu. So by default, I had it a wheel. I can also do sliders. So that's this one here. You can do boxes. So you have this option. And there's also tint. So you have that. I personally prefer the wheel, but you can choose whichever one you like. Now, if you want to see more details about your currently selected color, you can double click this circle here. And here you can see the actual values for the RGB, HSL, which is hue, saturation, lightness, and also the hex values down here. And as I move these values around, my shape changes if I have it selected. Once again, you can click the drop down here to get different versions of the color chooser. So I can do CMYK, I can do a saturation, but I'll go back to RGB. And let's go back to a yellow star. Now we talked about opacity before in the layers menu. There's another opacity here in the color box. So I can adjust the opacity of my shape doing this, dragging it back and forth. You can see the star is getting faded. I'll go back to 100%. Something you can also do is if you click on this dot here, it switches to a noise slider. So I'll click on this. 
And if you watch this area here, I can actually add noise to it. I'll choose another color. Maybe it'll show it a little bit more. So you can see this is kind of an interesting way to add a little bit of texture to your colors. Now, by this point, you're probably wondering, what does this circle behind our color do? You can see right now it's this white circle with a red line through it. Well, this is the stroke for our shape. And strokes are a fundamental concept in vector graphics. Right now, my shape doesn't have a stroke, but let me click on it. And what you can do is you can click on this circle in the back and it will come to the front. And I can add a stroke to my shape. Now I'll click it and I'll drag to black here. And you can see it automatically added a border to my shape here. I could also change the color if I wanted to to something else, but I'll go back to black. Now you can see right now the stroke is just a basic straight line. If you want to do more advanced options with the stroke, you can click this stroke tab here. And now you can see lots of options for my stroke. Probably the most important one is the width here. So I can change the width of the stroke. I can drag this back and forth. I can also change the appearance of the stroke by making it dotted. So right now I have it solid line. I'll click on dotted line here. And you can see it becomes dashed like this. When we have a dashed stroke, the controls down here affect the spacing. So I can add two here. And you can see it made that dash longer. These black ones here are the spaces, so I'll make this big. You can see it made the space really big. I'll make the stroke a little bit thinner so it's easier to see. But basically, if you want to play with how these shapes appear, you would adjust the spacing in this area here. Let me go back to a solid one. Now you can also use a brush for the stroke. So I'll click the brush here. And what you kind of have to do with this one is go to your brush menu. And you can select different options for the brushes. So maybe I'll look at one of the ink ones. Click one of these. You can still adjust the thickness. You can see it has a little more natural look. And there's other brushes, there's pencils. And if you zoom in, you can see it's a little more interesting than just a boring straight line. But for our demo, I'll go back to the boring straight line here just to show you some other options. Now there are other options here for a cap, join, and a line. I won't go into all of them, but they have different effects based on how sharp the edges of your stroke are. A line is kind of an interesting one where you can have the stroke be applied inside or outside the board of your shape. So right now it's in the middle. I can make it go inside. So you can see it kind of pulled the stroke inside or I can go outside. So you see now it's more on the outside. The cap and join are really gonna have different effects based on how sharp the edges of your shape are. Now, one of the more important options in this stroke menu is scale with object. So right now you can see my stroke is thick like this. If I resize my star, you can see the stroke still seems very thick and maybe sometimes that's what you want. So let me undo that. If that's not what you want, what you can do is you can click this scale with object button here. And now when I scale my star, you can see the stroke scales with it. So let me copy this. This is without scale with object. And this one is with scale with object. So very often when I'm bringing graphics into my design and I'm scaling them, sometimes they don't look right depending on whether or not I have this selected. So it's a good option to know about. Now, by the way, when I create a new shape, it will remember the settings of the last shape I created. So let me create a square here. And you can see it has the same stroke and fill color as my previous shape. If you want to completely reset the shape, what you can do is you can click this button up here that says revert defaults. And that gets you back to the basic settings again. Sometimes it's easier to just revert to the defaults instead of undoing all the strokes and colors you set in a shape. So if I create a new star now, you can see it has that basic setting again. Now, a very common mistake I make when I want to change the color of something is I select it and I change the color and you can see it didn't change the color inside. It changes the stroke. And that's because I have the stroke selected up here. Let me undo that. It's very easy to switch to the fill color. Just click on the fill here. And now I can actually change the inside of my star. And also you can see this circle with the line through it that clears your current selection. So right now I have the fill color selected. If I click this circle with the red line through it, that clears my shapes fill color. Let me undo that. If I select my stroke, I can clear that by clicking this button here. And now you can see the stroke is gone. And by the way, another way to clear the stroke is to go to the stroke menu and just click this little X here. So either way will work. Okay, now let's look at this other circle, which you may have noticed over here next to the eyedropper. And this is the color picker tool. Affinity Designer's color picker tool is very powerful. It's one of my favorite features of the entire program because it's so easy to use. To pick a color, all you have to do is just click on this circle and drag. And then whatever color is under my icon will be the color I select. So you can see I've selected green. If I want that to be the fill color, I just click this button here. And now it will be the fill of the next shape I create. You can see that it's green. Now the cool thing about this tool is it literally picks anything under your current cursor. So even if I select part of the UI, 
like if I choose this magnet here, it'll actually pick that red. And by the way, if you want to change the color of something, you can just select it and then click on the color picker tool here. It'll fill it in. Or while you have that thing selected, I have the rectangle selected here, I can color pick from something. And I'll click this button. And now it's that color. It also works with images. So I've brought an image into my design here and I'll talk more about how to do that later. But what I can do is with my color picker, I can select any color in here. So if I want one of these oranges, I'll just select it. And I can select my star and I'll click on the orange. And now my star is orange. Or I can make it green or blue. I frequently use this feature a lot to get colors out of an image like this. Now pretty much every color interface in Affinity Designer has a color picker. So earlier we talked about how you could double click on this to get this color chooser here. You'll notice here there's a color picker. So I could choose something here, click on it, and then it sets my color that way. Now let's look at how to create gradients. So I have a square here and the gradient tool is going to be over here. It's this tool here, the shortcut G. So I'll click on it and what I'll do is I'll click and drag on my rectangle here. And by default, the gradient tool is going to use the fill color and a slightly darker version of the fill color. So I'll click off this. You can see there's a gradient here from my original green to a slightly darker green. Let me change the color to blue. I'll do it again. I'll drag it the other way. Now you can see it's my original blue and a slightly darker blue. Now, of course, we can change this in a variety of ways. So this color over here, I can click on it and this activates my color chooser over here. Let's say I want to make it orange. I can select my hue and I can select a different level of saturation. Let's make it bright. And I can change the other side of it by clicking down here. So let's adjust this to something like red, maybe kind of like a rose color. So this is a simple linear gradient I created. Now the nice thing is even if I click off this object, if I click back on it and click the gradient tool, I still see this control here. And there's a lot of ways we can edit this control. For example, I can click and drag the point around. I can also add other points to it. So if I click on the plus here, that added another color point. And by default, the color is going to be what was already there, but I can change it. So let's change it to blue. Maybe I'll add another gradient point down here. Let's make it yellow. Not the prettiest gradient, but it gets the point across. And these lines in the middle allow you to change the distribution of the gradient. So for example, this blue going to yellow, I can have it be more yellow by dragging it this way. Or I can have it be more blue by dragging it this way. I'll undo that. Now before I showed you, if I click and drag this, I can move it around. If I hold control and click it, I can drag the whole line around here. So I can move my gradient into different places. Now this whole time I've been showing you this control here, but we have all these same options up here on the context toolbar. And not only do I have linear gradient, but there's other options here such as elliptical. I can hit control and drag this around. I can even shrink it a little bit. I'll hold shift and drag this in. There's also radial, conical, and then there's bitmap, which means you can fill the image with a pattern. I won't go into that here, but I have another video on creating seamless patterns with Affinity Designer. If that's something you're interested, I recommend checking out that video. Let me reset the shape here. Let's go back to blue. So the gradient tool is also sensitive to the magnetic setting. So I have magnetics turned on. I can click and drag from the middle and drag to the corner. And what this is really useful in a situation like this is with a radial gradient. So I can select radial and I can make this a more dramatic gradient. So that's an easy way to get a radial gradient that's perfectly centered. If you want another way to edit the colors of the gradient, you can click this swatch here. And now you also have the ability to edit the colors up here. And by the way, this goes to what I said earlier about there always being a color picker in almost all the menus. So I can click and drag. I'll just grab something here, red. And I added that color to my gradient. I also have the option of choosing the color here. So I can click this. Once again, my color picker, but I can do it some other way. Let's say HSL sliders. Let's make it yellow, a bright yellow. And there's all sorts of settings here. You can change the opacity. You can change where the midpoint is. You can also delete the point, so I'll delete it. One last point I'll make about gradients is that you can also add a gradient to the stroke. So by default, we had it as fill, but I can set it to stroke. So with stroke selected, I can click and drag. And right now it doesn't look that interesting because it's just black and white, but let's change the colors to something else. So that's what it looks like when there's a gradient on my stroke. And I can still do all the standard stroke operations here. So I can make it thicker, I can make it dotted, 
you can do whatever you like and the gradient effect is still there. Now, one last point I'll briefly mention with colors is that you can also create swatches. So that's with this menu over here, swatches. I won't go into a lot of detail here on how to do it, but these options are here for you if you want them. There's a whole bunch of pre-made swatches and you can set global colors and things like that. It's a little beyond the scope of this video, but just know that if that's what you're interested in, the option is here. So sooner or later, you're gonna to wanna to add text to your designs in Affinity Designer. So let's look at the text tools. There are two main ones to know, the frame text tool and the artistic text tool. So you're gonna find them over here and it's gonna be one of these icons, either the frame text or artistic text tools here. Let's start with the frame text tool. So I'll click this and then I can just drag an area to put my text in. And inside it, I can start typing. So I'll type test one, two, three. I can keep typing here, but really the frame text tool is used when you have multiple sentences of text or even paragraphs. So let me copy and paste something into it. I have this Wikipedia article here on the sun. So let me copy a couple paragraphs here. And in my frame text, I'll paste it here. Now you can see this is the text here that I just pasted in. And what I can do with the frame text tool is I can orient how I want that to be shaped. So I can change the width, I can change the height. And I have all the typical formatting options up here. I can center it. I can left align it. If you want it all to be aligned, you can select all of it and that'll affect the whole thing. So I can make it all left aligned. We have other text options up here so I can make individual words bold. So I can make that bold. But the key point to the frame text is that this is really useful for things like brochures or pamphlets or other displays where you're really gonna have multiple lines of text. Basically anything that's gonna be more than a sentence or two, you're probably gonna wanna use the frame text tool. Now let's compare it to the artistic text tool. So I'll select my tool over here. This is the artistic text tool. And right away you'll notice when I click and drag, I can actually change how big my text is going to be. So I'll let go and I'll say my text. So artistic text is really gonna be used when you have just a few words of text to write. And this is gonna be things like titles or slogans or things that are really short. So up here, I still have the common controls. I can change the fonts. I can change the fill colors over here. I can add a stroke. You can even use a gradient for this type of text. And once it's created, I can go and I can still resize it. I can type in new text. Now, sometimes with both these tools, you might get spelling errors. So for example, I'll put something in here that doesn't look right. You can see it highlights it red. If this is something you want, you can right click on it. You can say ignore spelling. That often happens with brand names or names that it doesn't recognize. I'll delete that. One other interesting thing you can do with the frame text is if you wanna get some sample text really quickly, if I delete this, if you right click on it, you can say insert filler text. And it just inserts this default text, which is kinda of useful if you're just testing a layout for something. You can still resize it. Now there are many options when working with text in Affinity Designer. To see those options, you can go to Window, Text, and you'll see several options here. Probably the most common one would be Character. And you can take that tab and you can put it here. You can see you have things like kerning and tracking over here. So with this selected, I can adjust the tracking, the alignment. I can adjust the baseline. Now, one thing you'll notice with artistic text is you can also wrap it. So if I'm here and I click enter, I can put it on two different lines. However, I think if you're working with complex designs, sometimes it's easier to just copy the text and manually put it on two different lines. I think that gives more control in a lot of cases. So I'll delete this. And instead of getting the baselines to align correctly in the exact way, you can kind of manually put it in its place here. And snapping is enforced, but I can turn that off and I can fine tune it how I want. So we have options here for shearing and all sorts of other things. Again, I won't go into all of it, but if you do want to have more text options, you can go to window text to show them. Now, something else that is very easy to do in Affinity Designer is to put text on a path. So a common thing you may want to do is put text on a circle. So let me add a circle here. And what I can do now is I can click my artistic text tool. And if I hover over the shape, you can see there's this T with the curly line there. That means I'm able to add text to it. So I'll click and I'll drag. And that just determines how big my text is initially. And I can add it in. Now the key thing here is you'll notice there's this green arrow and the red arrow. So to center my text, what I can do is I can drag the arrow to the left here. And it snaps to that side. And I can drag the red part to the other side and it snaps there. Now you notice this isn't centered, that's because I have it left aligned here. To make it centered, I'll just click on the align center, and now my text is aligned in the middle. And I can always add more text, so I can say coffee shop. Of course, you can change the font to wherever you want, and you can still change the colors and do all the normal text things. 
Now with text on path, you start to see what some of the options do here, such as the baseline. So I can put it above and below the line of my circle. I can also reverse the text path here. So now it's upside down, which doesn't look that useful, but what I can do is I can make it go to the bottom. So that's how I could get it on that bottom inside edge here. Now you can also make an arbitrary path and put text on it. So I'll choose the vector brush tool here. We'll look at that a little more later. And I'll just make kind of a wavy stroke here. And if I select my artistic text, if I click on the path, again, you see the T with the wavy line, I can start typing my words. Now how good this looks is really gonna depend on your curve. If you have curves that are too sharp and bunched together, your text isn't gonna look that great, but it's something you can tweak as you see fit for your design. Now what if you wanna use custom fonts in Affinity Designer? Well, Affinity Designer just uses the fonts that are already on your system. So if you wanna use a font, you would just need to install it. So I'll just show you briefly how to do that on Windows. I'm on a website called Creative Fabrica, which has tons of graphic design assets that I like, and they have a great font library too, so I'll click on that. I'll go to what's popular this week, and as you can tell, it's around Christmas time as I'm recording this, so let's see if there's any good Christmas fonts. This one here looks interesting, Candy Cane Comic. Let's see what it looks like. So let's download it and try it out. So I click Download. I'll install it into my Downloads. So in my Downloads folder, I'll just uninstall it. And then I have an OTF and a TTF. It doesn't really matter which one you install. I'll just install the OTF file here. Click Install. And I'll close that. So this is called Candy Cane Comic. So let's go to Affinity Designer. I'll add some text. And now with my text selected, I'll click this drop down over here. This is the font. And I'll start to type Candy Cane. And it comes up. So I'll click it. And you can see now I can use this font. So usually they show up without needing to restart Affinity Designer, but if you installed the font and it's not showing up, perhaps try restarting Affinity Designer. So that's how you install fonts. It's really quite simple and Affinity will just pick up what's already on your system. So up until this point, we've looked at how to use some of the tools in Affinity Designer and how to do some practical things. Let's take a step back and look at how the interface is actually organized. Maybe it seemed a little overwhelming at this point, but hopefully in this section, we can kind of get an idea of how it's laid out logically. One of the first things to notice is this bottom bar here. And right now it doesn't say much that's useful, but whenever I select something in my document, I get an entire context display here that shows what I can actually do. So if I click my background image here of these coffee beans, you see this context menu here gives me a list of all the options I can do with my mouse. So this area down here gives you some really useful hints on what you can do with your current selection. On the left side here, we have our tools, which shouldn't be confused with the toolbar, which when we select the tool, this is our toolbar up here. Now I mentioned this just to point out that not all the tools are showing by default. So you can go to view, customize tools, and you can get a list of even some more tools here that you can add to the arrangement. And if you wanna put them in a different order for ease of access, for example, maybe you want the text to be higher, I can click and drag it up here. I can click the node tool, drag it up there. You can put them in whatever order you want. And if you wanna get rid of this, you can go to close. Now if something you expect to see is missing or hidden, usually you wanna to go to view and see if it's checked off around here. This will usually solve most of your problems with not being able to view things. Over on the right, we have our studio options. And these are tools that usually are more complicated and have a more sophisticated interface. For example, you can see the color tool here has lots of options. We looked at stroke, so it has lots of things there that we can change. If you wanna see more of them, you can go to window and then look at the drop down list here. We won't go through all of them in this video, but you can see that there's lots of ones here that are pretty useful. Stock is a useful one, I can click that. And I can search for things online. If you wanna close it, you just click on the three dots here and close it. But if you wanna rearrange these items, you can always click and drag them in different places. So maybe I want my color to be down here. I can put it next to my layers selection, but I like it back up top, so I'll put it there. As I said earlier in the video, if you ever mess things up, like drag things around and they're not in the, the right place, it looks kind of like a mess here. You can always go to Window, Studio, Reset Studio. Now in the middle, we have the canvas, and this is the area we've been working on throughout this video. But something about Affinity Designer is that you can actually work outside of the canvas. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the backslash key here. And what you notice is now you can see the full range of my background image. The actual borders of my canvas are this gray area here, but it's possible to show things outside of your canvas. So if I hit the backslash key, I can toggle on and off. But one really nice thing about being able to see outside of your canvas is it's kind of like a nice draft area. So for example, if I wanted to work on some text on the side, I could write some text here. Maybe I wanted to do some experiments over here just to see if something looks good. Try a couple font options. One thing I like to do is put reference photos on the side to look at them. So again, if I hit this backslash key, 
you can see now I'm just seeing what's on my canvas here. And you can see this option in the menus by doing view, view mode, clip to canvas down here. Something you can also do is toggle this whole UI on and off. So I'm just gonna hit the tab key to do that. And you can see with the tab key, my studios and my toolbars and all that extra stuff disappears. So this is really cool when you want to show your whole work just to get a big view of it without any of the distractions on it. And I'll hit tab to make it go back. And by the way, that might be an accident you do at some point. You hit some button and your whole interface disappears. Probably you hit the tab key, so just hit tab again and it'll bring it all back. Now there's some other view options that might be helpful. You can also view your document in x-ray mode. So you can go to view, view mode. Then under wireframe, you can select x-ray. And now you can see it just shows you the outlines of your objects. And hitting control Y will toggle that. But this is good when you want to just get an idea of the borders of your shapes and don't want to be distracted by all the colors and gradients and whatever else you have going on. It can be good for debugging a design when something just doesn't look right and you're trying to figure out how things are actually working together. If you want to see both modes at the same time, you can do a split view. So you can do that with view, view mode, and then split view here, which is the comma key. So you get this dividing line here and you can see below I have two sections. Let me click on one side. I'll hit control Y with this side. And I can see half my document is in the wireframe mode and the other half is in the normal mode. So I can quickly scrub through and see what is wireframe and what is the normal mode. So to disable that, I'll hit the comma key. And again, if you're in the wrong one, and you don't like it, you can hit control Y to go back to the normal mode. Now up here we have these three buttons which are called personas. Personas are a concept that's in all the Affinity programs and it's a very powerful idea. They're essentially like different workspaces. So you can see over here we have this blue one. This is the designer persona and that's what I've been using so far in this video. And it's probably what you'll use the most in Affinity Designer. Next to it we have the pixel persona. So let me click on that. And what you notice is that it's almost like we're in a new program now. I got a whole new set of options on the toolbar. And these are tools that are going to be much more related to working with raster images, bitmaps like PNGs and JPEGs. Now, if you want to do these types of operations in detail, probably Affinity Photo is a better program to use in general. But definitely these options here are useful when you want to just make quick adjustments to something. We'll look at them in a little more detail later in this video. Next to the pixel persona, we have the export persona. Now, the export persona is used for having more sophisticated control over how we export our files. For example, if you want to export to multiple file sizes or multiple file types at the same time, the export persona can do that. This tool is powerful, but it's probably a little bit overkill if you're just getting started. It's beyond the scope of this video, but if you're interested in the export persona, I have a video on my channel that goes into it in detail. So let's go back to the designer persona. Now you may have noticed this prominent tool here called the artboard. We've actually been using an artboard during this whole video. However, since we've only had one, it hasn't really been that obvious, but now I'll show you how to use multiple artboards. So I talked about the canvas earlier, but you can think of your document as having multiple canvases. We'll call them artboards, and I can create one now. So let me click this tool here. I'll just drag it behind my design here. And now you notice I have an artboard. It says artboard one here. And if you look on my layers menu, you can see my design is in this artboard. I can change the dimensions of my artboard here. I can also rename the artboard. So maybe I want it to be logo one. Now, so far, it doesn't really seem that impressive, but here's the cool thing. I can copy my artboard. So let me right click on it over here and I'll select duplicate. Now, by default, they're on top of each other, but I can click on one and I can drag it to the side. Now, maybe I want to have a version of my logo that doesn't have a background image. It just has the vector design. So I can hide my background image here. Maybe instead of logo one, I'll just call it vector design. And then maybe I want to create a third version that's black and white. So I'll duplicate my vector design. I'll drag it over and I'll add a black and white adjustment. So we haven't talked about adjustments yet, but I'll just show for now what I'm doing is I have it selected here. I'm gonna click the adjustments and I'll just select black and white. And instead of vector design, I'll call it black and white. And you can see here we have three different artboards. Now they're all the same size, but they don't have to be the same size. I could create another artboard if I wanted. I could make it any size I wanted it to be. Maybe this one I want it to just have the text. I could put it here. Give it some font. Looks kind of coffee-ish there. I'll change the color. So you can see here, I have four different artboards. And if I wanted to move them around to make it easier to work with, I would just click on one and I can just drag it around. Now the question is, how do you actually export these designs to a file? For example, a PNG or something. Well, what you can do is go to File, Export. And then here in the area, you can choose which one you want to export. So I can choose Logo 1. I can choose the Vector Design 1. And I can choose the file formats here. And I can click export and it would save that file. Now, as I said earlier, this is something that the export persona is great for. So if I click the export persona, 
you could actually do all of these at the same time with one click. You could have some of them be PNG, some of them be JPEG, some of them be vector, basically any options you want. Like I said, that's a little out of scope for this video. So if you want a full explanation of how this works, check out my export persona video. So that's how artboards work. For the purpose of simplicity for the rest of this video, I'll just be using one artboard, but just know that it's a feature that's available. Affinity Designer is a vector-based program. So I wanted to take a moment to just back up and talk about what are vectors. Specifically SVGs, which is a vector format that stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. I created this empty document here, and let me just create a circle. I'll drag it out here. Now we know that if I save this file, normally it'll be an Affinity Designer file, but let me export it as a vector. So I'll export it as an SVG file. So I'll go to File, Export, and I'll just save it. I'll call it circle SVG. So now on my file system, I have the circle SVG file here. But what I can actually do is open it in a text document and view the contents of it. So let me do that. I'll open it in Notepad. And now you can see my circle SVG file here. Now you don't need to know what all this text means and you don't really ever need to edit it, but I do wanna give you an intuition for what's happening here. You can actually see our circle here. And over here you can see we have the fill, which is our cyan color. This is green and blue. 0, 255, 255. And we have these center points, X and Y, and the radius. So you can see how something like this could easily be scaled. If we wanted our circle to be twice as big, it's very easy for the computer rendering this image to just, say, multiply our radius by 2. And then the program drawing the circle has intelligence about how to handle SVG circles, and it's able to draw a perfect circle regardless of the size. Now let me try exporting this as a JPEG. I'll just say JPEG. And I have my JPEG file here. Let me open this in Notepad. Now you can see my JPEG here, and if I scroll through it, it's pretty much a mess. No human can really read this and understand it. So JPEGs are really good at handling bitmap data, especially photos. But even when you have something simple like a circle that's just blue, it's gonna give you this complicated output here that no human can really understand. So let's look at a couple more SVG shapes. I'll add a square. Let's make it some other color here. I'll select the pen tool and make a custom shape here. I'll talk more about this later, but for now, I'll just add a simple shape here. And I'll export it again as an SVG. I'll call it Shapes. Now if I open up Shapes in my notepad. So here we have the SVG file, and again, you don't need to know what everything means, but just to give you an intuition, you can see there's a circle here with some center points that we could understand. There's the rectangle here. And then we have this path, which is kind of my random lines here. But you can see it's just a series of numbers, really, that say where the points are. And we get some options here like stroke and the width of the stroke and the fill color, of course. So as we're building up an SVG document, of course, we like to use Affinity because it's very simple and it makes our lives easy. But behind the scenes, really, this is all you're doing is just creating a structure like this. And based on the numerical data, it's easy to scale things. When you want to make something twice as big, these numbers can just be multiplied by two and you've doubled your image. And whatever's rendering your image, whether it's Google Chrome or some other tool, understands how to put these SVG elements out on a screen. Now, one other thing you've probably been wondering, what happens when we mix an image with an SVG document? Well, let me show you how to do that. I'll go to Window, and I'll go to Stock, and let's just bring in a stock image here. So I have my simple vector shapes up top, and then I have my bitmap image down below. What will happen if I export this as an SVG? Well, let's try it. Export SVG. I'll call it Shapes plus Image. So these are my files. And by the way, right away you can see the SVG files by themselves are pretty small, but this one with the image in it is pretty big. So let's open it up. So this is the shapes plus the image SVG file. So this is this exported to an SVG. So right at the top, you can see we have our circle, we have our rectangle, we have the path. So those ones are pretty straightforward. But down below we have all our image data and you can see that here. And of course, none of this really means anything to us because we're not computers. It's all just kind of base 64 data but a computer can render this and display it. For example, if I open this SVG file in a viewer, this is Microsoft Edge, it's capable of displaying this. Now, if I increase my image size here, my vector shapes can scale infinitely here. So I'm always getting those sharp edges, but the bitmap part will not. It'll become pixelated if I make it too big. So in this section, I just wanted to show you why the shapes can scale infinitely, and we can also put bitmaps within our SVG documents, but the bitmap part you have to keep in mind will have a fixed resolution. Now, so far when looking at vectors, we've been using predefined shapes that Affinity has given us, such as circles. Let me put a few on the canvas here. So I'll put a rectangle here. I'll draw a circle. Let's do a triangle. 
Now, one thing I want to point out is if you look at the layers menu, all of these objects are named basically what they are. If I hover over here, it says triangle. This one says ellipse. This one's a rectangle. What if we want to create custom shapes? Well, those are called curves. And I'll create a few simple ones right now using something called the pen tool. So that's this tool here. And what I can do is I can click and outline a shape that I want to create. And then I can close it here. I can give it a color. And notice on the layers menu how it says curve. This is essentially an arbitrary vector that has any shape we want it to have. It doesn't have to be a filled shape. It can just be a stroke. So I can click some points here. I don't need to close it. I can give it a stroke. I can make it thicker. I also can do some combination of the two. I can create an arbitrary shape. And I can fill it in. I can also do basically half and half. So let me create an open curve here. And you notice it has no fill yet, but I can give it a fill. And you can see it's kind of dragging from the beginning and the end point and trying to fill in that area. Now, one more thing I can do is put a hole in a curve. So let me draw a curve here. I can draw the shape that I want to be a hole. And with the back object and the forward object selected, I can use a Boolean operation to subtract out the center. We'll talk more about this later, but for now, I'll just show it quick. I'll click subtract up here. And you can see that now it's a single curve with a hole in it. So essentially all vectors are gonna be some combination of these shapes here. These are our basic abilities we have. And it may look simple, but of course we can build up very complex designs with it. Now with these curves, this is where we really see the power of the node tool. And that is this white arrow up here. So when I click on it, I can click on my curves and then I have the ability to move the nodes around. I can click on my stroke here. I can make it look different. Even this one here, I can fix it. Maybe I don't like the way that blue part inside goes, so I can make it like that. And this curve over here, I can change the shape of the hole in the center of it. Now this node tool is quite powerful. However, you may notice we can't use it with our shapes up here. So if I click on it, it lets me resize, but doesn't really let me redo anything like I was down here. Now, if you do want to alter these shapes a lot, this is where the concept of converting to a curve comes into play. So right now, these are kind of what I call smart shapes. They know what kind of shape they are. They have the abilities of a rectangle or the abilities of an ellipse or triangle. But if we don't need that anymore and we just want to treat it like a normal curve, we can go to layers, convert to curves. So I'll do that with the triangle selected here. And now what you notice in my layer stack is that this triangle is now a curve. So it's essentially just like these other objects down here. And now I can drag around this point. I can also do it with a circle. I can say layer, convert to curves, and now it's a curve. So sometimes you want to do this, but keep in mind that you don't have those properties anymore of the original shape. Let me show you a star to give you an example of that. I'll draw a star here. And remember with our star, we have all our cool options here. We can give it as many points as we want. We can change the radius, do all sorts of interesting things. Let me copy this. And then this one, I'll convert it to curves. So I can press the button here, convert to curves, or I can go to layer, convert to curves. And now I have my star that's a curve. Notice I lost all my options up here. If I click on my original one over here, I still have the star abilities, but this one here is just now a curve. And if any designer doesn't know any special star properties about it. Now we can actually convert to curves with text too. So let me write some text here and I'll give it some type of font. Now this is my original text, I'll copy it. And this one here, I'll convert it to curves. So I'll click convert to curves up here. And we can see is on the layers stack, it created a group of all the letters here, but the letters now are just curves. So this is actually kind of nice if you want to customize some text, you know, like I can go and I can edit this E so it looks a little bit different. Maybe I want it to be an extreme E. I can alter this one. Maybe there's other aspects of the font you want to change. So this is nice if you want to customize some text, but you do lose the ability of it being text. I can't actually edit this anymore as text. Whereas with my original design here, I can change it. So my recommendation when you're converting text or some other complicated design to curves is to just make a backup copy of it. So I would keep this original one and I would copy it. And then this copy, I would convert to the curves. But if you can avoid converting to curves, that's always the best option. Now we looked at curves in the last section and curves are made from nodes. And there's a couple different node types. Let me just draw another shape here so we can get something on the screen. So I have a simple polygon here. And what you'll notice is that the nodes are square and that means they're sharp nodes. As you expect, they kind of start and end very abruptly at a sharp edge. What I can also do is make a smooth node. So if I select this node 
Over here, I can click the convert to smooth button. And now it's a smooth node. Now, what's special about smooth nodes is they have these handles here, and these are essentially Bezier points. And as you drag them, it influences how the line goes in and out of that node. I can hold shift to drag it along a straight line if I want, or up and down. I can drag the other side also. So the way these curves work is that whenever the line is entering the node, it's trying to enter along this path of the line here. So if I turn it up, you can see the line is curving so that it comes into the node along this straight line. And same thing with how it exits. So if I turn it this way, you can see the line is going along this handle as it exits and it's turning and trying to go back into this straight node over here. These handles can be a little tricky to understand at first. I recommend just drawing a couple shapes and playing with these handles here to see how they behave. So I'll undo that and I'll select it again with the node tool, the white arrow, and I'll click convert to smart. Now actually this is pretty much the same right here as the smooth node. The difference between smooth nodes and smart nodes is when you're actually drawing them to begin with. I'll show you that in a minute. And when you see a node is red, that means it's the end node. So if I click a path and draw it here, this red one here is the last node on my curve. And there are some operations where this is useful because you will be extending the curve. If you want to swap the end node, then with your curve selected, you can click this button up here, reverse curve. And now you notice this one here is red. And I can reverse it back. Okay, so we've talked in bits and pieces about how these curves work. Let's actually create some to give you a better understanding. And for this, I'll use the pen tool. So once again, I'll select the pen tool here. And there's a couple different modes you'll notice up top. Probably the simplest one to start with is polygon mode. So I'll click that. And I have some stencils here that I'll trace just to show you how it works. So I have polygon mode and you can see that essentially this one is going to be very straight. You can see it's creating those sharp nodes. And I can hold shift to drag it really horizontally. I can hold shift again to drag it up and down. I'll do shift again here. I can even go 45 degrees if I wanted to. I'll hit control Z and undo that last one. So again, I did this with my pen tool and I used polygon mode. So I'll select my pen tool again. Now, even though it's called the pen tool, there's a mode called pen mode. So I'll click this. And this one is gonna be much more about how I create those curves. So I'll do is I'll click here and I'll click the middle of this curve here and I'll drag. And you can see it's dragging out a handle here. And this is gonna be a smooth node. I'll click again down here. You can see it's dragging out a curve there. I'll do it again up here and down here. Now, one thing you can do, of course, after you create the curve, you can zoom in. And maybe I didn't do it quite right. Maybe I can go and select this one and I can tune it a little bit to get it right. You can always change it how much you want. So I was with the pen mode and with the pen mode, I was putting down smooth nodes. Now I can use the pen mode with straight lines also like I was using with polygon mode. I can click and I can just hold shift. And I'm not dragging, I'm just holding shift and clicking at certain points. But now what I can do now is now I can click and I can drag if I want to add a little bit of a curve. Now once I do that, it starts to curve again. Let me hit control Z. What I can do is I can hold right mouse button and left click. And I'm back in the straight mode. And that was a little tricky because when I held the right mouse button, you can see it brought up this context menu. You can just kind of ignore that when you're doing this. What you want to do is hold the right mouse button and then just left click so you can get back into that straight line mode. Now, speaking of lines, there is also just a line mode here. And I'll just make lines that are two nodes each. So I'll click once, click twice, and then it's over. Click once, click twice, and there's nothing else happening. It's just stopping after every other click I make. Now, one tricky scenario is this wave here. And the way I prefer to do this is I actually prefer to just start with a polygon mode. So what I'll do is I'll select polygon here and I'll just click from point to point. And then what you can do is you can actually select the node tool itself. And if I hover over the line, you can see a little wavy line there next to my cursor. I can just click and drag it down. I'll click and drag here. I'll click and drag here. And I'll just make my waves that way. So here I used the polygon tool and then using the node arrow, I dragged the lines out. Now earlier, I talked about the difference between smooth nodes and smart nodes. Let me show you that difference now. So we have the pen tool and I'll go back to my pen mode. And remember with this, what I said is you can click and make straight lines, but then I can also click and drag to make curves. So that was with the pen mode. Let me now do smart mode, which is next to this. And with smart mode, I don't need to click and drag to make curves. It'll automatically do it. 
So I'm just clicking points here and it's automatically trying to add the curve here. So this means I put these nodes down in smart mode because they're the circle with the dot in the middle. If I change it, it just becomes a normal smooth node again. So we have smart mode enabled. It's trying to create those curves automatically for you. Okay, so let me give you a little demo of using the pen tool and I'll use this fish here. To make things easier, I'll reduce his transparency a little bit here. And the first thing I'll do is I'll select my pen tool and I think pen mode is good to start with. And I'll just start making those curves. This point here is sharp. I think I'll make it smooth. I can always adjust these to bring it in. I'll start doing the fin here. So I'll start off with a curve. And I'll do the trick I did before of right clicking and left clicking. So I'll right click, left click there. Now I'm making straight lines. And then what I'll do is I'll go to my node tool and I'll just pull this in here. And again, you can always fine tune these afterwards. It's always good to start off roughly and then worry about the fine details later. I'll do the same thing for this side. That looks good there. There's always more than one way to do these things, of course. I'll do this line here. And you can see there I converted it to a smooth curve and now I can kind of fine tune it. Even though this is a pen tool tutorial, I think for this fin here, I'll just use a shape. There's a teardrop shape here and I'll do that. So let's rotate it. No use making more work for ourselves. Same thing with the eye. You can just draw a circle. I'll use the pen tool for the scales here. And we can copy and paste and just rotate. For the top of the fence here, I'll just do individual curves. For the mouth, there's another shape we might be able to use. There's a moon crescent. Let me find that here. And I'll just do this bottom fin. And that's how you could use the pen tool to trace a shape like this. As I said, we can always fine tune it and make it perfect, but this gives you a basic idea of how you could go about that process. And don't be afraid to use predefined shapes if it can make your job easier. Now you may also notice here that we have lines overlapping each other. We'll look at how to fix that later in the video when we look at the shape builder tool. Now I wanna cover a really important point about how nodes work. So far you've probably noticed that we have a node and you have one line going in and then optionally we have another line going out. But I made this design here and you may think to yourself, how is it that we can get a point in the middle such as this where you have four different lines going into the same point? And the answer is that you actually don't. So let me select the node tool here. And what you notice about this pie chart here is that actually in the middle, when you have a node, there's still only one input and one output. So I'll drag this this way. So you can see we have a node there with only one line going in and one line going out. But what's happening here is we have multiple nodes overlapping. So I'll click on this again and I'll drag this out here. I'll click this here and drag this out. I'll click this here and drag this out. So you can see that no matter what, whenever we have a node, we have at most two lines going into that node. And the same thing happens over here on the edge. You may see all these lines going into this point. But if I zoom in, if I select my node tool, if I click here, we really have overlapping nodes. So I'll pull this apart again. And here you can see indeed one line going in, one line going out. So when you're trying to build a shape like this, it's important to keep in mind how that works. A lot of times you're gonna be using overlapping shapes to give this illusion that you have intersection points where multiple lines are going in and out of. So the viewer may think that the points are connected, but in reality, these points are just overlapping each other. Okay, let's continue looking at how nodes work and let's look at some common actions we wanna do with these nodes. Now, some of this might be hard to remember, but the important thing to know is that when you select the nodes, you have a lot of these options up here on this action menu here. So let me start with the first one, which is what do you do if you want to delete a node? And what does delete a node mean? Well, if I select this node here in the middle, I'll hit the backspace key and you can see it removed that node. And what it did is it joined the nodes around it. So that's one common scenario you may want to do, just remove a node from the curve. Now, what if you want to add a node into the curve? Well, that's where the split function comes into play. So I'll select this curve here and I'll select this node in the middle. And what I can do is I can click this first action called split curves. And what that will do is it will add an extra node there. So if I click this button, you can see it added this node here in the middle. That is the new one. I'll undo it and do it again. So I'll click split and we have a new node there. Now there's actually a much easier way to do this if you want, which is that if you have the node tool selected, you can just click on that point on the line. And now I actually have a new node. I can click anywhere and make a new node and click there and click there. 
But if you like to use menu options, you can use that one up here. Now, this is one case where the direction of the curve comes into play, because what it's doing is it's creating that split in the direction of the end of the curve. So if I click it, you can see it split there. Let me undo it. What I can do is reverse the curve now. So now you can see that this is the end point of the curve. Let me select that same node. So now when I split, it's gonna appear here. So there's the new node. But really, I never use that menu for splitting a node. I just click on it because that's much faster. Now, before we looked at delete, now we have the break option. And this might be what you thought delete did, but what break is going to do is it's actually gonna split our curve into two parts. So I'll select this node here, and now I'll click break curve up here. Now, at first, it doesn't look too much different, but what I can do is with my move tool, I can actually split my curve now. It's actually two different pieces. So that's how you can break a curve into two pieces. Now, the opposite of that would be join. So I have this example on the end here. With my node tool selected, I can select both these curves and I can highlight these nodes here. And then what I'll do is I'll click the button up here that says join curves. So you can see now I have one curve that's these two older curves joined together. So again, originally it's two separate curves. With my node tool, I'll select both of them. I'll make sure I select the nodes here. I'll drag a square around them and I'll click join curves. And now they're together. And now I'll back up and go to close curve. So what close curve is going to do is it's going to join your end node and your beginning node. So you can see my end node is the red one here and the beginning one is this other one. I'll click the close curve button and now they've joined together. Now, finally, you may be wondering, how do you actually continue a curve? How do you keep extending it after you've deselected it? Well, I'll select this curve here. With my node tool, I can select the last node here on it. And if I go back to my pen tool, as I click, it will keep extending that curve. If I want to extend on the other side, I can click that node there. And with my pen tool, I can extend out that way. So that's how you continue a curve. We looked at how to split up line segments. Let's actually look at how to split up a shape now. And there's a really easy tool to use that called the knife tool. And it's right over here. Now, if you ever notice that you click and drag and it's not working, you actually have to select your subject first. So with the move tool, I'll select my object here. And then I'll go back and select the knife tool. And it actually works quite simply. You can just click and drag a path through your shape and you get a nice slice there. I can keep going both ways. And now these are separate curves that I can pull apart. Let me undo that. So when you select the knife tool, there are different options up here. You can do straight line mode. So it just cuts in a straight line to where you drag. So if I want to go directly this way, I can cut like that. And as usual, holding shift will limit it to 45 degree increments. So I can do that way. You can also make it auto close. So if I click and drag like this, if I let go right here, it'll automatically drag back to my start point. Now you may remember before when we talked about a point can't have more than two lines going into it. So if I click and drag this way, I can let go there. And you notice there's three lines intersecting this point here. But if I zoom in and drag the nodes apart, you can see it's actually two nodes on top of each other. So we're not violating any of our rules there. Now you may have heard of something called a scissor tool. Affinity Designer doesn't really have a standalone scissor tool. Rather, it's just a mode of the knife tool. So with the knife tool selected, if I hover over the line here, you'll see I get the scissor icon. And if I click there, what I can do now with the node tool is I can actually pull that apart a little bit. And you can see this is what the scissor tool does. It kind of breaks the line there. So if you're looking for a scissor tool, you're not gonna actually see one. Rather, it's a hidden mode on the knife tool. So we've looked at how to create our own vectors, but a very common use case for me and others is downloading vectors that we've bought from websites or stock photo libraries. So let's look at how we can actually import other vectors into Affinity Designer. So a site I really like is Creative Fabrica. They have lots of great designs that you can use for your work. And some of them even have print on demand licenses so you can use them on products if you like. I'll put a link down in the description, but be sure to check it out because they're always having deals on year long subscriptions. So I found this SVG design I like. It has some kind of minimal floral elements to it. Let's download it. I'll put it in my folder here. And notice it has the print on demand license. So if you downloaded something like this and you wanted to put it on mugs or t-shirts or whatever, you could do so. So I've downloaded it here. Let me extract it. And let's see what we got here. So we have a mix of files, AI files, which are Adobe Illustrator, EPS, PDF, SVG. Let me sort by type. And here we have the SVGs. So right now on my computer, they open by default in Microsoft Edge, but I can also open them with Affinity Designer. So here I've opened this graphic in Affinity Designer. Now say I had an existing blank document over here. There's a couple ways I could bring this design into it. I could just select the whole thing, do Control C and then Control V. And I could resize it so it fits. I'll hold Shift so it's in the right dimensions. Another way to do that is through the Place menu. So I could go to File, Place, and I could navigate to it on my computer. 
and I could find 7.svg and open that. And I could click and place it. So the one on the left is the one I copy and paste it in. The one on the right is the one I placed. Now, if you notice the one I placed here, if I click on it, it'll actually open it up in a new tab. And when you place an SVG, it considers it an embedded document. So if you want to edit it, you'll be editing it out in this other tab here. A lot of times I like to work with things within my document itself. So I like to just copy and paste it in here. So if I double click on the one that I copy and paste it in, you can see right away I have access to all the nodes and controls here. So which one you want to do is up to you. I'm going to delete the one I placed. And I'm just going to work with the one that I copy and pasted here. Now, all vectors you download, of course, are going to be unique and they're going to have their own structure. But this one has some common elements that I think are worth pointing out. First, if I click on it, you notice that it's all just one curve. Sometimes you get a design and it's all one curve. Sometimes you get a design and it's like 50,000 curves. So that really is going to depend on what the artist who created it did. Also notice that these letters here, they're not really text. I mean, they look like letters, but if I click on the node tool here, you can see that they're just special shapes. So if I wanted to change this, what I could do is I could select the node tool. I would select all these nodes and then I would just delete them. And then if I wanted to put in my own text, I would have to just type it and choose my own font here. So maybe I have some type of handwritten font. I could change it like that. So usually when you download designs like this, the text isn't going to actually be text that you can edit. It's just going to be shapes. And if you want to work with it, you'll have to delete it and make your own. I'm also curious here what the role of strokes are. So I can see I have black fill and black stroke. Let's make the stroke red. And you can see this is the length of the stroke here. Sometimes designs have a stroke, sometimes they don't. I think in this case it's fine. I'll just make it black again. Something you may also want to do is check to make sure that the black is truly black. So here I have the shape selected. Let's check this fill color. I'll double click on it. And it does appear to actually be black, all zeros. But sometimes when you download designs that are in CMYK format or some other format, they'll be slightly not quite black. It might be something like, let's see, I don't know, 12, 12, 12 or something like that. So if you want true black, just verify that your design is black. I'll set this to pure black again. Now, what if I wanted to use parts of this design? Like I didn't want to use the whole thing, but maybe I just wanted to use some of these flowers. Well, there's definitely a couple of ways we could go about it. Probably the easiest way is to use the knife tool. So I'll select this design and I'll select my knife over here. Let's say I want to get this flower on the edge. I could just cut it through here. Now after I cut it, I can pull apart my shape. So my flower is actually standing by itself over here. I notice there's a little bit here, a little extra bit. I'll delete that. And I have a new graphic that I could copy and paste, rotate, change size as I wanted. Looking back at my original shape, I noticed there's a little bit of a bump here. So I'll go to my nodes. And I could just delete these. And that basically smoothed it out. So this just gives you one of many examples of how you could actually work with vectors that you downloaded from online. You can use the knife tool to slice them up into different parts. You can delete text and put in your own text. You can also change the colors, of course. And that's one of the great things about vectors. You can really modify them and tailor them for your own purposes. You may also be curious, how do people actually create these graphics? Do they use the pen tool and just freehand flowers and text like this? The answer is almost certainly not. I suspect what people like this do is draw their designs in some type of raster program and then vectorize them with a tool. For example, these flowers and this bottle might have been hand drawn and then they used a tool to convert it to a vector. Now, unfortunately, as of this video, Affinity Designer does not have a vectorization tool. There's no way to load line work you created and convert it automatically to vectors. But I do have a video on free vectorization tools, so check that out if that's something you want to do. So in the last section, we talked a lot about vectors. Now let's talk about how you can work with raster images. And this would include JPEGs, PNGs, and basically any other kind of bitmap formats. So let's start with how to bring in a single image to our document. So I have this file open here, and what I'll do is I'll select File, Place. And now on my computer, I have several PNG files here I want to bring in. Let's just bring in one for the moment. I can click Open. And you can see my cursor has this down arrow icon next to it. That means I can place an image now. So I'll just click and place it. Let me delete that and do it again. Let me show you a slightly different way to do it. When I bring in the image, what I can do is I can click and drag to determine the size that image will be when it first comes in. Now, of course, like all elements in Affinity Designer, you can resize it if you want, rotate it, but it's kind of a little convenient trick when you bring it in to begin with the ability to resize it like that. Now you can also bring in multiple images at once, and that works pretty much the same way. I'll go to File, Place, and I'll select all four of these PNGs. 
And now you notice I have this menu over here of the images that are in the queue to be placed. So like before I can click and I can drag. What I could also do is put them in in different order. So if I wanted to, I could place this ice cream four in next. And I'll do ice cream three. I'll just click this one. And I'll do ice cream two. And then once you're done, if anything else is still remaining here, you can just close this. Now I brought these images in, and as you can see in my layer stack, the images are over here with their file names. They'll behave similar to vectors in this layer stack here. I can put them over each other, of course, and behind each other. The order here is going to matter, so this ice cream two here, if I want to be behind everything, I would drag it to the bottom. So no surprise there. These can also be rotated and resized. Now when you select an image over here, it will show its original resolution. And it will also calculate the DPI for you. And this is going to depend on how big you make this image in your document. So if I zoom out here, if I select my ice cream cone here, if I make it too big, you can see the DPI starts to go down. And this makes sense based on what we know about how DPI works. But for the meantime, of course, it's useful to know that you can't just get infinite resolution with bitmap images like you can with vectors. So that's the difference with bitmap images. You are going to lose quality the bigger you make them. So it's a good idea to keep an eye on numbers like this up here. Now, there are two ways images can be put in your document. They can be embedded or linked. And the way you can see this is you can go to Window Resource Manager. And here I have a list of all the resources in my document. So let me adjust the columns so you can see it. So it tells me various information about the files here. And I can see that this ice cream is embedded. And that means that the image is actually stored within my document. So if I send this Affinity Designer file to people and they open it, they can see this image perfectly well. And that's really good for organizing your files, but there is a downside because you may be copying images into your document that take up extra space. And also maybe you want to have someone work on this image outside of your document and you want to have it automatically update in Affinity Designer when there's a change. So the way we can do that is we can make it a linked file. So with this selected, what I'll do is I'll select Make Linked. And now you can see it says Linked here. And now this file won't actually be stored in my document anymore. It will sit outside of it. Now, the interesting thing about this is I can update this file outside of Affinity Designer and it will update inside here. So let's do that. So I've opened the file here in MS Paint and let's add a little cherry to our ice cream here. Give it a little stem, maybe a little highlight. It's not fine art, but it gets the point across. So let me save it. And I'll go back to Affinity Designer now. Now I got this message in Affinity Designer that said the file had been updated. So let me go to the resource manager again. And you'll see here it says the status is modified. And what I can do is I can press this button update. And now you see I get my updated file here. I'll close this. Now if you like, you can also make it so files will automatically update and you don't have to click that button. You can do that through edit, settings. Under general, you can select this box here, automatically update linked resources when modified externally but I'll just close that. So that gives you an idea of the difference between embedding and linking images in your document. By default, they're embedded, but you can change it to linked if you wanna have the ability to edit the file outside of Affinity Designer. But keep in mind that when images are linked, if you don't send the image over with Affinity Designer to some other person, they're not actually gonna be able to see that image when they open your document. So we've imported an image, but if you look around the interface, there aren't many tools for actually working with images. So what about things like paintbrushes and selection tools? Well, those are in the pixel persona, which we briefly looked at earlier, but let's look at it in some more detail now. Now remember our personas are up here. By default, we're in the designer persona. I'll click on the one next to it, the pixel persona. Now we have this whole new set of tools over here. Now one of the most crucial concepts for understanding how images work in Affinity Designer is to understand the difference between an image object and a pixel layer. So if I look at my layer over here, if I hover over the layer, you can see that this is an image object. And when something is an image, I can resize it, I can rotate it, you can do opacity, but essentially that's kind of it. Let me select the paintbrush here, this is the paintbrush tool. I'll select the brush. Let me select some color that will contrast with it. Now if I try to paint on my image, you'll notice it gave me this message about rasterizing my image. And now if I hover over this icon here, you can see that it's a pixel layer. So whenever you want to use a paintbrush or anything that's kind of a destructive technique, you're going to want to use a pixel layer. Let me undo that. Now a better technique instead of painting on your images directly, if you can avoid it, is to create a separate pixel layer. So I undid it so my ice cream layer is back to a image. Let me manually add a pixel layer here. And now I can add my cherry on top over here. You can see it didn't give me that warning message because I'm on a pixel layer already. And the cool thing about this is that I can toggle the pixel layer on and off. So I'm not actually destroying my image beneath it. Now, if you want to manually rasterize your image, you can do so. So you could right click on this and you could say rasterize. 
and now my ice cream is a pixel layer. The downside is that when you do that, it's gonna lock in whatever your current resolution is. So let me undo this. When it's an image layer, I can resize it up and down and nothing's really gonna affect it. You can see it maintains all that image data. But now if I shrink it down, let's say I rasterize it. Now I bring it up again. You can see I lost a lot of that clarity here. So when you rasterize an image, you're going to lock it into that resolution that it was when you had it at that size. So when possible, it's definitely nice to separate your pixel layers and your image layers. Now let me show you the painting options in a little more detail here. As you saw before, I clicked the paintbrush tool. And oftentimes you're gonna wanna change the brush type and that is the tab up here, brushes. So you can see we have many different options. We have acrylic. A lot of times if you want something just solid, you would choose the basic one and choose one of these round brushes. And of course you can change the color to wherever you like. Now using the right and left bracket keys, I can make the size of my brush change. So I'm making it bigger now with the right bracket. I can make it smaller with the left bracket. And I can just draw on little things here. Maybe I'll put some sprinkles on my ice cream here. Now as with brushes in most programs, we have different options up here for opacity and flow and hardness. So opacity of course is your transparency. So if I set the opacity to 59, you can see it's kind of this color. If I set it to 100%, you can see it's stronger there. So there's lots of brush options up here you can change. We also have the eraser brush over here. So when I select that, I can erase out. But the eraser is actually a type of brush. So let me put some solid color down here. I'm just painting this in here as a demonstration. When the eraser is selected, I can actually change the brush type of the eraser. And this is kind of good when you wanna do some type of textures. So maybe I have a spray paints here. So my eraser is going to erase in a spray paint pattern. Change the flow a little bit. So this isn't painting white, this is actually erasing part of my color here. So if I copy and paste this, you can see that part is transparent. Now the Pixel Persona also supports raster masks. So with my layer selected here, I can click this button here to create a mask. And by default, it's empty. But the way masks work is that when I paint on my mask with black, it will hide part of my image. When I paint with white, it will reveal the image. And gray will be some level of transparency in between. So this is a really good way of non-destructively erasing part of your image. So for example, maybe I wanted to erase all the ice cream here. What I could do is with my brush selected, I'll select black as a color, and now I'm on my mask. So what I can do is I can paint here. And even though I'm painting black, I'm on my mask, so it's erasing it. So I can erase down in here. Now maybe I got too much there. What I can do now is I can select white. I can zoom in. You notice when my brush is hovering over it, it gives me a preview of what will happen if I click. So I can kind of see where it's going here. I'll try to add some more in. And I can go back and forth to get the shape I want. Maybe a softer brush would be better in this situation. Again, when you're using a mask, you can use any brush you want. Now, if I alt click on my mask, you can see that what the mask itself is actually doing. This is where I painted the black part of it. And I can alt click to go back to it. And I can also toggle the mask on and off. So if I click the visibility button here, Here's my original ice cream. I didn't actually delete any of it. I just masked out some of it. Now I was doing black and white, but I can also paint in gray. So I'll give it kind of a transparent feel here. So maybe there's some reason I want to do this. Now let's look at my mask. So you can see this is the gray part here, giving it a little bit of transparency. And you can also paint on this part here if you want, but it's hard because you can't actually see your image. Work with masks is something that takes a little practice, but once you get used to it, it's a really powerful technique. If you can get away with using masks and not deleting your image, it's definitely the way to go. The Pixel Persona has several other options, but I think we've covered enough for this video. But the main things I use it for are quick little touch-ups I wanna do to raster images, and also adding raster masks. So now let's go back to our designer persona and look at the vector brush tool. In the last section, we looked at how to use a pixel brush. Now let's look at how to use the vector brush. Now remember when we used the pen tool, we could click and add points to make our strokes here. When I select the vector brush tool, however, I can actually click and drag to make a stroke. So when you have this vector brush tool here, what you can do is you can go to your brush menu. I'll go that here. And you can select the different types of textures you want. So right now I have this kind of this graphite scribble. I can select other things, oils. And of course I can also change the color. Now what's interesting about this tool is that when I click my stroke here, if I go to my node tool, I can actually see the nodes that made that stroke. And I can adjust them and tune them if I want them to be a little bit different. So all the vector brush is doing is letting us just really make a stroke by clicking and dragging. And that's just putting down smooth nodes in our path. Now earlier we were talking about editing strokes and you can do the same thing with your vector strokes over here. If I click on the stroke, all it did was just use this brush here. I can make it straight again. I can make it dotted. I can adjust the width. 
but I'll go back to my brush. You can also change the type of brush after you've made a stroke. So I'll select something else here. I'll select one of these engraving ones. I'll make it bigger. So that's the same path with the engraving. I can make a pencil. Again, that's very thin. I'll make it thicker. It has a little bit of a natural feel to it, you can see. When using the vector brush tool, I can click and I can hold shift to drag in straight lines. So there's other options up here, such as opacity. You can do the stabilizer options. There's also the controller method, so I can select velocity, and that's gonna be how quickly I drag my mouse. So if I draw really quickly, you can see in the quickest part, it's thin and that gets a little bit thicker as it goes on. Now, one downside of the vector brush tool is that unfortunately, unlike the name implies, it's not a true vector. For example, if I draw a line here, if I zoom in, you can see it's really just a bitmap here that it's putting along a path. You don't have infinite resolution on the vector brush in Affinity Designer like you do in some other programs. The reason it's called the vector brush is really because you have this ability to edit the points here, but really the actual images itself don't have vector properties. Now it'd be nice if this shape was truly a vector, like all the texture and stuff was shapes, but unfortunately that's just not the way it works right now. Now one thing you can do with vector brushes is you can actually create your own. So what you can do is you can go to your brushes menu here, and I created my own little category here called my test brushes. I did that just by selecting up here, creating a new category. And with my category selected, I can click the three dots here and I can say new solid brush. If you double click on the brush here, you can actually start editing it. Now by default, the solid brush isn't really that interesting, but you can change the width of it. You can change the way it tapers at the end. You can do the opacity variance a little bit there. You can change the pressure curves. I should mention that if you have a stylus, it will actually work with this too. Once I close this, so with my vector brush selected, I can draw my stroke there. But that one's kind of basic. Let's create our own brush with our own pattern. So for that, once again, I can click on the three lines here and I can say new textured image brush. And what that will do is bring up my file explorer and I can choose an image to serve as my brush. So I'll click this three colors here, this little mini rainbow. And now with that pattern selected, let me select my brush. I'll make it big and I can click and drag. Now you'll notice something here that might happen to you and that is that it's pink. That's because my color selected here is pink. Now probably that's not what you want. So what you should do is when you use your own brush, make sure you deselect the foreground color here. And now when I draw my shape, I'm using my actual bitmap image. And if I double click on this, I can edit the properties I edited before. The size, the variance, can taper part of it. And just like with our other vector brushes, I can move around the individual nodes. Now, depending on what your image looks like, you might get some sharp edges that don't quite look right, like here. Sometimes you can kind of move it around and get it to a point where it looks a little bit better. I can try fixing this. It really depends on the type of image you have. If you have something very graphical with sharp edges, you're going to notice these harsh transitions here. But if you have something more organic, it's probably not going to be as obvious. Something you'll probably do a lot is export an image that's a mix of raster elements and vector elements. So I made this simple little design here and you can see I actually have vector text here. I have a circle in the background and then I have this bitmap image in the front. So probably the best way to export this image would be as a PNG or a JPEG. Probably a PNG would be slightly better because a JPEG can sometimes have a hard time with these straight lines. So to export, I can go to file, export, and I'll choose PNG. Now you'll notice a PNG, I have a white background. You can have a transparent background also. Let me cancel that. If you go to document setup up here, under color, you can click transparent background and okay. And that'll give you the transparent background here. So let me export this again. And with my preview here, you can see the checkerboard in the background. So it's transparent. I'll do export and I'll say ice cream logo. And here I have the file and I can open it, of course. And you can see it's transparent. It's showing in this Windows image viewer here, which gives that that black background. Now, quite often when you export your designs, you will be exporting them as a PNG or a JPEG or some type of bitmap format, even if they are totally vector based. And this may sound counterintuitive because don't we want vectors to be scalable? And the answer is yes, vector scalability is a great property to have. But a lot of places that you want to put your vectors might not actually support vectors. For example, certain print on demand sites or certain image based websites may only want PNGs or JPEGs. Now, the good thing is that as long as you keep your source files in the vector format, you can always export to PNGs at different resolutions. So it's pretty common to have your original files stay in the vector format, but to actually deliver the files as PNGs or JPEGs to clients or some type of website that you're posting them to. So we've looked at raster images. Let's get back to the world of vectors and let's look at how we can actually build up more complicated designs from simple shapes. 
And the first tool we'll look at is the Shape Builder tool. So to show you how it works, I have three circles here. You can see they're just circle shapes, ellipses. And the purpose of the Shape Builder tool is that you can select shapes and actually add them together or subtract them. So let me show you what I mean. I'll select these three circles here. And what I can do is I can select the Shape Builder tool, and that's this tool over here. So I'll click it. And when I clicked it, you can see I got this outline here of all my shapes. It's almost like the wireframe mode we looked at earlier. Now with the Shape Builder tool, there's two main modes, addition and subtraction. And you can see up here, there's a plus and minus button. I like to set the mode before I do the operation. I find that a little bit easier. So I'll click the plus button to start with. So you can see my wireframe here. When I hover over shapes, you'll see there's kind of like this grid look. That means I can select that shape. And if I click and drag, I can actually build a new shape. Let me undo that. Now maybe I want this middle triangle part to be one shape. So I'll click and drag around there. Now if I click off, you can see this middle part is its own design now. Let me undo that. I can also do subtraction mode. So let me select the shape builder again. I'll select the minus sign over here. Now what if I want to delete all the parts that aren't this middle triangle? Well, I can delete this outside edge here. I clicked and dragged on the red circle, it goes away. I'll click and drag on the green. I'll click and drag on the blue down here. Now this middle part is all kind of separated. Let me join it. I'll click the plus and I'll join it all up. So you can see from those three circles, I built this new shape here. Now I can make it so I can confirm the addition or subtraction after I draw the shape. So let me select my shape here. And you can see it's kind of like a cat silhouette. I'll select the shape builder and I'll disable the plus here. So what I can do is I can select the sections I want. And then afterwards I can decide whether or not I want to add them and subtract them. So in this case, I want to add them. I'll click the plus and you can see they're added and it used my fill color here, but I can always change it back. The result of this is a new curve, which you see over here. And like all my curves, I can adjust the stroke. I can add gradient to it if I want. I can treat it just like any other curve. If I want to subtract here, I can select this whole shape here. I'll do my shape builder. And because none of these are selected, I'm free to just select what I want and then decide afterwards what I want to do. I'll click minus and now I have my new curve here. There's a couple different selection modes you can use depending on what's easiest for you. So before I was using freehand, that's when you just click on the shapes you want. But there's also the line mode where you can kind of drag a line straight through the areas you want. And there's marquee mode where you can drag a rectangle around it. This can be good for designs where there's lots of tiny little pieces, like I can see that in this one here. It's hard to get some of these inner areas, but if I just do the marquee, it's easier to select them. And I'll hit plus to add it together. Now earlier I showed you this fish example when I was using the pen tool. We can see with the shape builder how we could actually finish it up. So for example, I could select the whole thing and I could fix this fin down here. I'll turn on plus and I'll select freehand and I'll join it up there. Now one thing you want to make sure of is that the lines actually cross over each other. And I can see when it highlights yellow that it's joined. And now I can actually fill in these areas. I can see this part isn't filling in. Let me check out what's happening. So I think this part wasn't joined. And yeah, now it seems to work. I notice this bottom part isn't selecting. Let's check it out. I'll make sure it highlights yellow there. Let's check out this other part. Let's go back to the shape builder. Yeah, now I can fill in that area. These fins over here are really disconnected. The shape builder isn't showing me anything. Let's fine tune it a bit. Getting this yellow highlighting is really the key part. Let's look at it again. And now we can fill it in. Now, of course, the colors changed because we had it selected to something different, but we can easily change it back to what we want. You may want that to be orange. So that's how you can use the shape builder to build up a vector design. First, we traced it with the pen tool, and then we kind of cleaned it up and created the areas with the shape builder. Another way we can combine shapes is with Boolean operations. And this is what people used to use before the shape builder tool. But even though we have the shape builder tool, it's still a very useful concept to know. So let's start with the Boolean addition operation. So if I select these two shapes here, I just have a regular square and a circle. The Boolean operations are up here. And this first one is add. Let me just copy it over here. So you can see my original and you can see the result. I'll click on the add operation and you can see it combined my two shapes into one new curve. Now I made another copy down here. This is similar to the first one, except the circle is behind it. Let's see what happens in this case. 
I'll click add. You can see we got a similar result. The only difference is that the color changed. We got the color from the background element. So you can see that add gave us the same shape regardless of the order of the elements. And that works with addition in general. As you probably know from math class, A plus B is the same as B plus A. The only real difference here is that the color changed. And of course, if you don't like the color, you can always change it just like you can with any curve. Next, we have subtract. So let me take these two guys, copy them over. And subtract is right next to add. So I'll click the subtract button. And what we can see is it took out the object in the front from the object behind it. So it subtracted this circle from the square. Let's look at the other way here. And maybe you want to take a moment to guess what happens if we do subtract on this one. Well, let me select them. And I'll click subtract. And you can see it did the opposite. It subtracted the square out of the circle. So with subtract, the order of the objects actually matters. And this goes again with math class. A minus B is not the same as B minus A. Now, if you ever forget the order, I find the icon kind of helps up here. It shows you that this circle here is being subtracted from the rectangle behind it. That's kind of how I remember it. So let's move on to the next one. Here we have intersect. So let's do it again. Intersect is this third option here. So I'll click on it. Now you can see we got this little pie slice here, and that's actually the area of overlap between these two objects. If I change their transparency, you can see this dark area is the shape we got. Let's see what happens if I do it the other way. And once again, like add, you can see we got the same result, just a different color. So intersect is going to find the area of common overlap in your objects. And once again, I think the icon does a pretty good job of showing that hint. Next, we have XOR, so let's look at that one. I'll click XOR here. And you can see it's almost like it did the opposite of intersect. It took the area that isn't overlapping. Now, on a superficial level, that's basically how XOR works. You can think of it as taking the parts of your image that aren't overlapping each other. But in reality, it's a little more complicated than that. Let me select these three elements here. I made them transparent so you can see through them and you can see what they look like. Let me copy it. And let's do XOR on these three guys here. So you can see the result might not have been what you expected. This middle area is being overlapped a lot, but it's still included in the final result. What XOR is actually going to do is remove areas that have an even number of objects overlapping. So you can see these parts here, these have two circles overlapping and they're getting removed in our image. And it's gonna keep areas that have an odd number of shapes overlapping. So this middle part has three circles overlapping. It's being kept here. Technically, these outer areas only have one object overlapping, so one is odd, and that's being kept out here. So it's a little bit of a technical detail, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're using XOR a lot. Finally, we have divide. So let's check out how this one works. It's the last option here. I'll click on it. And when I first click on it, you don't really notice as much, but if I actually work with these shapes, I can pull them apart. So what divide is gonna do is kind of break your shapes apart based on their overlapping areas. Now, Booleans are nice, but as you may have noticed, they're actually destructive. So when I select these two shapes, if I click Add, you can see I just have my final result curve. My original circle and square are gone. And that may not seem like such a big deal, but what if I want to slightly move this square around and reposition it? I can't really do that very easily. So that's how compounds can help us. Let me undo this. Now, compounds work very similar to Booleans. The only difference is that they actually create a group of your original shapes and they don't destroy them. So let me create an addition compound here. Now, before I just clicked on the plus sign up here, now I'm going to hold Alt and click on it. And the result here looks very similar. But if you look on my layer stack here, you can see this says compound and I can actually expand this. And I still have my original rectangle and ellipse. And the nice thing about this is I can actually reposition them to look differently. I can resize it. So this could be my new additional shape now. If I were to draw other shapes out in the open here, I could drag them into my compound and then they become part of it. I'm just kind of making a random shape here, but it gives you an idea of what's possible. In my compound group here, if I hover over the icon, it says addition. That's because it was added in there. I can change it to subtraction by just clicking on it and saying subtract. So here I've built up a much more complicated shape and I haven't actually destroyed my original shapes here. I've just put them into a compound. And again, the way I did that was just like doing my normal Boolean operations, but I held Alt as I clicked on the button there. So I can do a more complicated example. So here's a more complicated example I built up and everything in it is still editable. I can adjust these little designs here. I just have a heart shape in here. I can make it smaller. I can adjust this center point. So that's the power of compounds. They work like Booleans, but they're also non-destructive. 
Now let's talk about the concept of clipping, which is when we put one object inside of another. So I have some simple shapes here, a circle and a square. What if I wanted my circle to appear only within this square? In other words, I wanted this outer part to be cut off that's outside of the square. So we do that with clipping. And what I'll do is I'll select my ellipse in my layer stack here, and I'll drag it onto the name rectangle. And if you look over here, you can see what happens. It limits my circle to only be displayed inside my rectangle. And in fact, over here, I can expand my rectangle and you can see the ellipse is still in it. Now let me undo that for a second. You may accidentally click and drag over the thumbnail here, and then you'll get this black and white ellipse. That's a different effect called a mask. We'll look at that in a bit. If you do that, just hit Control Z. And I'll drag the ellipse back over the name and let go. So when we have clipping enabled, we can still work with our object within it. I can move it around. I can resize it. But I can also work with the rectangle itself here. I can move it around and it preserves the relative position of the shape within inside of it. Now, if you want this circle to stay in place and not change, with your rectangle selected, you can select Lock Children. And as I move my rectangle around, the circle stays in place. And same thing if I scale it. But usually that's not what I want. Usually I have Lock Children turned off, but it's gonna depend on what your use case is. And I'm not limited to just one shape in my rectangle. I can add multiple ones. Now, if I drag my star over the name Rectangle, you'll notice it disappears. And that's because it's outside of the rectangle. So if I click off, it looks like my star is actually gone, but it's not. I'll click on the star here in the layer, and then I'll drag it back into my rectangle. And the clipping layer here follows all the normal rules of our layers. My star is in front of the circle, but I can make it behind there. I can also clip the star into the circle. So if I drag the star over the name ellipse, I have clipping within clipping there. I'll take it out just to be simple. And I can also toggle the displays on and off. So I can hide the star temporarily, or I can show it. Now clipping also works with text, and here I have some text. It's perfectly editable. Let me just show you. You can see there that's actual text. And I can drag my water over it. And on my layer stack here, I could drag this image over the name water test. And I can resize it so it fills the whole area. And if I expand my layer stack here, you see I have the image clipped inside the text. And I can still change this text. If you type and you find the image doesn't quite cover it all, you can always reposition the image or resize it. I can also put an image in shapes. So here I have this cat image. And over here I just have normal curves. I've created a heart with a stroke here. There's an ellipse, a rounded rectangle. So I could take my cat here, click, drag it over. And it's clipped into this little frame here. I could do the same thing over here. This is a really good way of creating kind of a border or frame effect. So clipping is a really powerful technique for taking a shape and kind of confining it to another shape. There are two types of masking in Affinity Designer, pixel masking and vector masking. We looked at masking with pixels in the pixel persona section, and this part we'll look at vector masking. So this is kind of what you may have accidentally done in the last section if you drag the ellipse over the wrong part of the layer below it. Let me do that now. I'll take my ellipse and I'll drag it over the thumbnail of the triangle. And you can see that our triangle is only showing where the ellipse was overlapping it. What I can do is I can select my ellipse here. And if I move it around, it becomes a little more obvious what's happening. So I'll click off now. So you can see this is our ellipse and the triangle is only being shown in this part here. And I'll drag it down here. So let me give you another demo with a more complicated vector. I have this vector over here. This is a shark and you can see it is a vector. If I expand it, there's just curves and other shapes that make it up. But what if I want to confine it to just a circular area? Well, let me collapse my shark here. And it's a big complicated group, but for our purposes, I can just leave it closed here and just consider this layer up top. What I'll do is I'll put my circle over the shark and I'll drag the circle over the shark thumbnail. And now you can see I'm just showing part of the shark there. So this is a really good way to block out the parts of the image you don't want to show. Maybe I just want to show the fin here. So I have just the shark fin. Or I can do just like the head there. And notice with my shark layer here, this top part is the mask. This icon here indicates that it's a mask. So let's put masking and clipping side by side so we can see a clear difference. So let me copy this down here. So in this case, I'll do the mask. That's these top two ones here. Let me drag the ellipse over the thumbnail. So this is the masked version. So our circle is only letting the rectangle show through in that little part. Let's do the clipped version. So I'll drag my circle into the triangle name. So this kind of gives a little more demonstration of the difference between masking and clipping. With clipping, we put one shape inside of another. When we mask, we use this shape to block out areas that aren't within it. 
But I would say probably the most important thing they'll notice about masking is we don't actually show any of the orange circle here. We just use that as a way of showing part of the triangle. Sometimes we want to add something a little bit extra to our designs, and that's where special effects come into play. And by special effects, what I'm referring to are blend modes, adjustment layers, and the FX settings. So let's start with looking at blend modes. Blend modes are a big subject, and I have a video on my channel covering all of the blend modes in the Affinity products. You can check that out after this video if you like. It's another long one. But for now, let's do a brief little crash course in the blend modes and see how they work. Now, blend modes work with vectors and images. I'm going to use an image in this example just because I think it's conceptually a little bit easier to show how they work. But I'll do a quick demo at the end with vectors and blend modes. So when you select any type of object in your document, you can set the blend mode for it. So if I select this image here, you may have noticed this word here that says normal. This is the blend mode of the selected layer. I can actually click it and choose other options here. Now, right now, nothing meaningful will really happen if I click on these, but let me add a square over my image here. And I'll make it gray. So you can see right now the blend mode of my rectangle is normal. And of course, as you expect, it's blocking my image. And this is just the way the normal blend mode works. It stacks one layer on top of the other and you can't see it unless you change the opacity. But we'll leave the opacity at 100% for now. So what I'm going to do with this rectangle here is I'm going to show you how some of the blend modes work. So let's look at them now. So in the first group, we have these darken blend modes. The first one is literally called darken, but they all kind of do some form of darkening here. So this is our darken group. And as I select them, if you look at my image here, the area under the rectangle, you can see it's starting to get darker in different ways. Probably the most popular mode here is multiply. And what you can see is that as I make my rectangle darker, it actually makes the image under it darker. And if I go fully black, it becomes fully black. If I make it fully white, it's actually invisible. Fully white has no effect for the multiply mode. Now I don't have to just limit myself to the grayscales. I can actually drag out into the color area. You can see it's making it darker, but it's also adding an aspect of color to it. So that's the first group with darkening. The next group are the lighten modes. So as I scroll the through these, you can see all the different lighting effects. And again, which one you choose is going to depend on your situation. But in general, screen is a pretty popular one. So I'll select screen. And you can see the part of my rectangle that's overlapping the image is making it brighter. And once again, color will have an effect on this. Below that, we have the contrast modes. And what these are going to do is they're going to combine a lighten and darken effect into one layer, depending on whether our value is above 50% or below 50%. So it's actually not that obvious what they do with a solid color. Let me make this a radial gradient here. So now I have a radial gradient here. So I'll put this over my image. And now I'll select one of these contrast modes. So here I'll select overlay. And in case you don't know what the gradient looked like, this is what the gradient looked like. You can see the center part that's white is actually lightening up the image. And the outer parts that are darker are darkening it. So I'll toggle on and off. You can see this middle part's getting brighter. The outer parts are getting darker. And in general, that's the way a lot of these contrast modes will work. Underneath the contrast modes, you have these other ones that have kind of mathematical names. These ones are a little more advanced, but they're good for stuff when you want to do something like take the negative of an image or compare it to another one. Below that, we have the component modes. And these are the ones that you can use to change your hue, saturation, lightness, and contrast. So for example, hue, I select my rectangle of hue. Since there's no hue and it's gray, you can see my image is gray here, but I can change the hue and it's going to give the layer below it that hue. And at the bottom, we have some more that are also kind of specialized. You can kind of play with them and see what you like. I think glow and reflect are kind of interesting. I put glow over here. If I change the color, can definitely get some pretty cool looks there. But with a lot of these modes, you just kind of want to experiment with them and see what looks interesting. So we looked at most of the blend modes using a raster image example, but they also work perfectly well with just vectors. I won't go through all of them again, but I'll just show you a quick demonstration here. I have an ellipse on top of another ellipse, and I can make this top ellipses blend mode to multiply. And you can see the effect that's happening on the vector below it. I can also set it to screen, so it's making the middle lighter. I can set it to hue, so the blue of the top circle is influencing the circle below it. I can also do things like erase to cut out one part of a circle from another. So blend modes are a very powerful tool. Like I said earlier, if you want an in-depth discussion of them, check out my full-length video on my channel. Now let's look at adjustment layers. And just like blend modes, I have a detailed video on my channel describing how they work. But for now, let's give a brief example. And once again, I'll use a bitmap image just because this shows the concept a little more easily than vectors. But all these concepts work with vectors as well. So with my image selected here, what I can do is I can select the adjustment layers down here. It's kind of this circle that's half black, half white. So if I click on it, I get a list of all these different adjustments. 
And there's quite a variety of features they have here. So I won't go into all of them, but let's just look at a simple one and see how it works. And I'll select HSL here. And the purpose of this description isn't really to show you exactly how this HSL adjustment works, but more to show you how adjustment layers as a concept work. So for the time where I'll just say about this is we have the original colors here and I can actually click my slider and rotate them around. So I can make my cherries blue. I can increase the saturation, maybe change the luminosity and I'll close this adjustment here. Now the way adjustments work is that when you add one, you can see it tied to this layer here. And if I expand it, it's more clear. If you want to keep working on it, you can click on it again and you can just change it. And you can close it. And the nice thing is that you can also toggle them on and off. So I can hit this toggle visibility button and it goes on and off. Let me make the cherries blue again. Now, one thing that's interesting about adjustment layers is that they themselves act as a mask. So if I go to the pixel persona, I can select the paintbrush with my brush selected. I'll select the black color and remember that black hides in a mask. So what I'll do is I'll click around here. And you can see I can actually erase part of the effect that the adjustment layer is having. You get a little preview of it right here. So I alt clicked on it to see what it's doing. I can alt click back. So every adjustment layer acts as a mask. Now I personally prefer to manually use masks for adjustment layers. So with my adjustment layer selected, I can click mask layer and I can drag it over here. And I can also do the mask here. The reason I like this a little bit better is because you can actually toggle it on and off. I'm not aware of a way to do that if you're actually writing on the adjustment layer itself. So that's why I like adding the mask manually a little bit better. I'll delete the mask for now. And I'll go back to the designer persona. Now we can also use adjustment layers with vectors. So let me do that. Let's make the red square. I'll make a blue square. So let's add an adjustment layer to the rectangle here. We'll do our HSL one again. And I can rotate the color of that square. So you can see originally our rectangle was blue but when I added the adjustment layer, it's green. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because you can actually click and drag the adjustment layers around. They're not permanently tied to where you created them. So I can drag the adjustment layer up top here. Now you can see it's affecting everything below it. It's affecting the red rectangle and the blue rectangle. And this is really useful for adjustment layers because sometimes you wanna have them affect everything that's below them. So you can see there are many settings here that you might wanna to apply to everything like levels or curves. Exposure is a very popular one. A lot of these are really good for working with bitmaps. So that's kind of a brief crash course in adjustment layers. Like I said, I have another hour long video on my channel about all the adjustment layers in Affinity products. So check that one out if you wanna learn more. Finally, we have the FX option. So if you have something in your layer stack selected, you can click on this button here that says FX. Now I won't go into all of them in detail here, but I'll give you a couple of the highlights. First, we have the outline option here, which is very similar to stroke. So I can click outline and I can change the radius. What's interesting is there's also this plus button here so I can add another outline and I can change the color and I can change the radius again. So I can keep adding additional outlines if I like. And then when you're done with them, you can click the X if you wanna remove it. Sometimes you just wanna to toggle something on and off so you can just click the check mark. And then when you click it again, it'll come back to your original setting. Outer shadow is another very popular one. This is essentially a drop shadow. So when you click it by default, it doesn't really do much. You kind of have to adjust the radius here. And then I'll offset it a bit. So you can see now my star has a shadow. And I can adjust the intensity. That's kind of how sharp the edge is. I'll turn that one off. And the last one I use a lot is Gaussian blur. So if I click this, you can make your image blurry if you like. It can definitely be good for adding a little bit more of an organic feel to certain shapes. So let me go back and add the drop shadow here. I'll close this. So when you add an effects, you can see that there's this FX button here. Just click it if you want to modify it and they can change it as you like and close it and go back. Now you can also add effects to entire groups of objects. So let me delete this. I'll add a couple of shapes here. What I can do is I can select my heart and star and I can control G to group them. And then at the group level, I can click the FX button. So let's say I want to add drop shadow to all of them. I can select outer shadow. And I can increase the radius, offset, make it a little sharper, and I can close it. Now, if I expand it, you can see the FX is applying at the group level here. If I drag the heart out of there, it's not going to have that drop shadow anymore because it's not in a group. So layer effects are another way to add some special looks to your images. Congratulations, you made it to the end of this tutorial. You may be wondering where to go next to learn more about Affinity Designer. 
On my channel, I have an entire playlist with Affinity Designer videos and tutorials, so you may want to check that out. I go into much more detail in many of the tools that I talked about briefly in this video. Also, don't forget to download my ebook with many tips that couldn't quite fit into this current lesson you're watching. It's free, but if you want to donate a few dollars to support this channel, it'd be much appreciated. And of course, if you have any questions or requests for future videos, feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.